know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk continues my revisionist history of the Lincoln County War as covered in talks 12 to 17. The information is from my book, The Santa Fe Ring versus Billy the Kid, The Making of an American Monster. By the start of 1878, with escalating violence, Thomas Benton Catron, boss of the Santa Fe Ring, had snuffed out territorial anti-ring uprisings in the Santa Fe capital, in Grant and Colfax counties. By 1878, he was assured of cover-ups. His co-boss, Stephen Benton Elkins, was in Washington as territorial delegate. President Rutherford B. Hayes was complicit. By 1878, Catron was poised for takeover of 19,200,000 acre Lincoln County, the largest county in the United States. There he had mercantile and ranching presence, sub-bosses and agents, and loyal troops at Fort Stanton. That just three men challenged his monopoly must have seemed trivial. The first, Alexander McSween, had almost become a Presbyterian minister. He'd worked as an attorney for Catron's local bosses at their store called The House in the county's seat of Lincoln. He quit in 1876, disgusted by their abuse of government contracts to Fort Stanton and the Mescalero Indian Reservation. They rustled for beef and sold inferior flour and hay. That year, he turned to private law practice in Lincoln. The second man was a young British entrepreneur named John Tunstall. McSween convinced him to settle in Lincoln and make a store and ranches. The third was their ally, Cattle King John Chisholm, victim of ring rustling. Catron recognized that elimination of Tunstall would eliminate the other two since he provided cash from his wealthy father in London. Catron's favorite attack was malicious prosecution. Assassination was a backup. In position at the house was savage hooligan James Dolan its first owner, Lawrence Murphy, was Catron's front. In 1873, Dolan was a clerk at their original sutler store in Fort Stanton, known as L.G. Murphy & Company. Dolan got them kicked out. He tried to kill 9th Cavalry Captain James F. Randlett for exposing their corruption to the adjutant general. Murphy and Dolan were arrested but with Catron's apparent intervention, their charges were dropped. Rand Lett was charged instead. In 1878, after Murphy retired, Dolan took over the house. He made Catron's shady cattle dealer, John Riley, his partner in J.J. Dolan and Company. 
in 1875, Ruff Riley's attempted murder shooting of Lincoln's anti-ring Hispanic leader Juan Patron had left him a limping cripple. So Catron's lethal sub-bosses were in place. Ringite enforcers were in place too. Fort Stanton's Major William Brady became Lincoln County's first sheriff. The house's builder, George Pepin, got that office later by a legal proclamation of Ringite Governor S.B. Axtell. The rest were District Attorney William Reinerson and 3rd Judicial District Judge Warren Bristol. In place also was a spy. Saturnina Baca was a Ringite Lincoln resident. Unsavory, in 1855, he'd married a 14-year-old. In the Civil War, he served under Kit Carson, becoming a captain. Later, at Fort Stanton, he participated in the Indian War's genocide of Apaches and Navajos. There he befriended the Sutler Store's Ringites. Discharged in 1867, he settled in Lincoln. He then worked with that store's owners, Emil Fritz and Lawrence Murphy, to monopolize supply of inferior hay to the fort. In 1868, Baca, with Catron, Murphy, and Brady, got a bill passed forming Lincoln County. Lincoln was the county seat. Brady became its first sheriff. Ringite Governor Robert Byington Mitchell made Baca a probate judge. In 1878, Baca was caught stealing 12,000 pounds of coffee, sugar, and other supplies from the Mescalero Indian Reservation. He was likely colluding with Agent Frederick Godfroy to supply the house. In 1882, he murdered black Lincoln resident George Washington for eloping with one of his daughters. In 1878, he proved a traitor to his people in the Lincoln County War battle. The Lincoln County solution was not as easy as Catron and his minions thought. John Tunstall was a new type of ring victim. His idealism, sweetness, fairness, and vulnerability of a blind eye made him tenderly beloved. He was a potential martyr in the making. Billy Bonney would be his ranch hand only four and a half months before his murder, but it was enough to convert him from a dangerous delinquent to a rebel with a cause. By 1877, Tunsil had built on the northeast side of Lincoln's only street a single-story building housing his store, bank, and personal apartment. It stood just a quarter mile east of the house. He made John Chisholm his bank's president. Under the Desert Land Act, he had gotten about 4,000 acres of ranch land along Lincoln County's Felis and Penasco rivers. So he controlled miles of grazing land by access to its only water. And McSween built a two-wing house next door to Tunstall's store. There, he and his wife Susan resided on one side. At the other lived his brother-in-law and law partner David Shield, husband of Susan's sister Elizabeth, with their five children. There, McSween and Shield had a law office with Shield's law student, Harvey Morris. Historian Frederick Nolan's 1965 biography, The Life and Death of John Henry Tunstall, reprinted Tunstall's loving letters to his London family. They reveal his inability to comprehend the ring's lethality. In June of 1876, He'd been pointed to New Mexico territory by a California rancher 
though warned by him about the ring, Tunstall wrote to his family. He says the politics are in the hands of a ring who control things as they like. He says that as soon as I go there, everyone will know my business, that it is a rare field full of razors. By March of 1877, Tunstall responded naively to his more realistic family's fears. He wrote, as regards my getting shot, I don't expect it. There are two very prolific causes for shooting in this country, namely drink and jealousy. I don't frequent the locality of the former, and I don't make myself an object for the excitement of the latter. I have a presentment that I shall not get killed. He added, the whole of New Mexico is under the control of a ring composed of two or three lawyers and their practices and power throughout New Mexico are quite astonishing. In April of 1877, to much beloved father, he prattled about rings as self-styled adventurer. He thought a ring was a way to do business, so he gave his own plan. He wrote, I propose to confine my operations to Lincoln County, but I intend to handle it in such a way as to get half of every dollar that is made in the county by anyone. So, guilelessly, Tunstall overlapped the ring with his store, bank, ranches, and plans. And true to British proclivities, he bought fine horses and became attached to them. That last idiosyncrasy would be the immediate cause of his death. In the Colfax County War, the ring had harassed settlers they wanted to expel by attacking their stock. Likewise, in September of 1877, Jesse Evans and his gang were used by the ring to steal Tunstall's horses and mules. But Tunstall, as he wrote to his family, was amused. He thought it was dime novel antics when Jesse, who ultimately killed him, raged that his three shots had all missed Tunstall's foreman, Dick Brewer. Tunstall merrily reported that the gang threatened to kill him, McSween, and Brewer because they were incited by people, quote, whose business I have very nearly taken away. That meant the house. By November 7, 1877, Tunstall encountered usual ring-eyed obstruction of justice to shield members. Jesse Evans and his gang had been arrested, but Sheriff Brady let them escape. Then Brady tried to incite Tunstall to violence to kill him in fake self-defense. Brady accused Tunstall of aiding the jailbreak, then drew his gun. McSween intervened, but Brady gave away the ring plan by blurting out to Tunstall, you haven't long to run. By late 1877, Catron rolled out malicious prosecution. His diabolically convoluted plot used as its hook Alexander McSween. McSween had been hired to collect a $10,000 life insurance policy of the house's first partner, Emil Fritz. He had died in test aid in Germany in 1874. McSween represented the heirs, including Fritz's local siblings, Charles Fritz and Emily Scholand. But the crooked policyholder refused payment, forcing litigation in New York to get the money. Legal fees depleted the sum to $7,000. McSween delayed payment to seek German heirs, and he awaited the probate court's decision on James Dolan's fraudulent claim that Fritz's estate owed the house $76,000. 
McSween was unaware that the ring controlled Charles Fritz by mortgage of his ranch near Lincoln. He was unaware that Dolan, District Attorney William Reinerson, and Judge Warren Bristol were poised to attack him. On December 21st, 1877, Charles Fritz's sister, Emily Scholand, was manipulated by Dolan and Reinerson into filing an embezzlement complaint with Judge Bristol. It claimed that McSween had stolen the policy's money. On December 25th, Catron, as U.S. Attorney, advanced the malicious prosecution. Knowing that McSween and his wife Susan, along with John Chisholm, were leaving to St. Louis for business, he made up that McSween was absconding with the embezzled money. He got a warrant from Bristol to arrest him. Vindictively, Catron also had Chisholm arrested as reneging on loans. Both were jailed in Las Vegas by the San Miguel County Sheriff. McSween was then transported back to Lincoln by honest and brave Deputy Sheriff Adolf Barrier. He knew McSween was in grave danger of ring murder, so he kept him in personal custody as McSween awaited his hearing. But crafty John Chisholm stayed in the remote Las Vegas jail to wait out the ring's inevitable violence. On January 18, 1878, Tunstall joined the fray in what he called a taxpayer's duty. He attacked the ring in an editorial titled A Taxpayer's Complaint. It appeared in January 26th, the Mesilla Valley Independent. He must have been amused that the real embezzler was a local lawman. He accused Sheriff Brady of embezzling tax money to buy cattle from Underwood and Nash through James Dolan and John Riley. It was dangerous to accuse Ring-Eyed Brady. It was more dangerous to identify rustlers, Underwood and Nash, as recipients. Nathan Underwood and Josiah Joe Nash worked with ring-eyed Seven Rivers rustlers Milo Pierce and Louis Paxton. In 1877, Chisholm's men had caught Underwood and James Dolan herding Chisholm's rustled cattle to Underwood's cow camp. Presumably, they were intended for Catron's Pecos cow camp for the house's government beef contract. Sheriff Brady shielded Underwood and Dolan from prosecution. So implied in Tunstall's complaint was that Chisholm was feeding him evidence for a chain leading to Catron and his rustler-based sourcing of cattle. On January 29th, James Dolan responded for the ring in the Messiah Independent he made up that Brady had missed the tax deadline because of sickness in the family. He added snidely that Tunstall, being no gentleman, was excluded from respectable circles, so was unaware of real circumstances. Catron's biographer, Victor Westfall, in his 1973 book, Thomas Benton Catron and His Era, linked Catron to the taxpayer's complaint as paying off Brady's embezzled money. It revealed Catron's entanglement with the Indian Department and John Riley. Westfall wrote, Catron had paid the money on behalf of Brady with proceeds of Indian Department vouchers made out to John H. Riley and forwarded to the First National Bank of Santa Fe for deposit. Naive Tunstall thought it was just an endurance game. On January 20th, he wrote home, I won't give up or back down as long as I can give another kick. On January 31st, Tunstall 
with 18 days to live, finished his last letter to his father as much beloved governor. He was about to travel to Messia for McSween's hearing, unaware it was a trap for him. On February 4th, Alexander McSween, his law partner, David Shield, <clears throat> his protector, Deputy Sheriff Barrier, and his supporters, Tunstall and Justice of the Peace, John Squire Wilson, left for the Messia hearing with Judge Warren Bristol. They were unaware of Colfax County's Mary McPherson's 1877 exposés of Bristol as a corrupt and dangerous ring tool who should be removed. Victor Westfall, Catron's biographer, inadvertently revealed that Reinerson and Bristol were front men for Catron's malicious prosecution. Westfall also wrote that Catron was responsible for creating the embezzlement judgment issued by Bristol. At the hearing, Bristol set the ring's traps for McSween and Tunstall. To enable Sheriff Brady to take McSween into fatal custody, Bristol set bail of $8,000 with approval only by District Attorney Reiner Sim, who would refuse all bondsmen. That would leave McSween open to lethal jailing by Sheriff Brady. To ensnare Tunstall, Bristol lied that he was McSween's partner. That made Tunstall also responsible for McSween's debt. Bristol ordered property attachment of both men for the faked embezzled sum of $10,000. Brady was to do the attachments. It was a harassment plot to incite their violence to justify Brady's killing them in so-called self-defense. Biographer Westfall revealed Catron was also part of the Bristol Reinerson bondsman trap. He reported that Catron threatened Jose Montano that if he became surety for McSween's bond, he would prosecute him as U.S. attorney for cutting timber on public land. On February 8th, Brady began attachments by ransacking McSween's Lincoln House. Next invaded were Tunstall's store, bank, apartment, and ranches. Outrageously, Brady's inventory sum far exceeded Bristol's required $10,000. At the February 11th, Tunstall store inventory, furious Billy Bonney almost did the violence sought by the ring, but he was stopped by fellow Tunstall employee, Fred Wade. This torment didn't stop McSween's anti-ring crusade. Knowing his innocence, he assumed he'd prevail in April's grand jury. So on February 11th, Seven days before Tunstall's murder, he exposed James Dolan's, John Riley's, and Mescalero Indian agent Frederick Godfroy's beef and flour frauds to Secretary of the Interior Carl Schurz. He wrote, I suggest you send a detective here who will ferret this matter. He'll find things as I've stated them. It was time for murder. To be repeated was the Ring's 1875 ambush killing of Colfax County War's anti-Ring leader, Reverend Franklin Tolby. Used were Catron's Lincoln minions. Sadistic District Attorney William Reinerson featured in the plot. In 1867, he'd murdered Chief Justice John P. Slough, 
Slough had just exposed Reinerson's ring-rigged 1867 election to the legislature. Catron's co-boss, attorney S.B. Elkins, had gotten Reinerson off on self-defense. In 1876, Ringite Governor S.B. Axtell had made Reinerson a district attorney. Reinerson revealed the plot in a February 14th letter to co-conspirators John Riley and James Dolan. Tunstall had four days to live. Alexander McSween later found it, folded in Riley's pocket notebook, accidentally dropped in his house after Riley came on the night of Tunstall's murder to lie that he was not involved. Freakishly seven-foot sadistic Reinerson wrote, Friends Riley and Dolan, if Mr. Weedman, that was Tunstall employee Robert Weedman, interfered with or resisted the sheriff in discharge of his duty, Brady did right in arresting him. And anyone else who does so must receive the same attention. Brady goes into the store in McSween's place and takes his interest. Tunstall will have the same ride there he had heretofore, but he neither must not obstruct the sheriff or resist him in the discharge of his duties. If he tries to make trouble, the sheriff must meet the occasion firmly, underlined, and legally. I believe Tunstall is in with the swindlers, with the rogue McSween. They have the money belonging to the Fritz estate, and they know it. It must be made hot for them all. The hotter, the better. Especially is this necessary now that it has been discovered that there is no hell. It may be that the villain, Green Juan Batista Wilson, will play into their hands as alcade, meaning justice of the peace. If so, he should be moved around a little, shake that McSween outfit up till it shells out and squares up, and then shake it out of Lincoln. I will aid to punish the scoundrels all I can. Get the people with you. Control Juan Patron if possible. You know how to do it. Have good men about to aid Sheriff Brady and be assured that I shall help you all I can, for I believe there was never found a more scoundrelly set than that outfit. This replicated 1876's Colfax County War's Dear Ben plot. It is discussed in Talk 11. Carried out by Ringite Governor S.B. Axtell, it attempted murder of four Ring opponents in Cimarron. Axtell telegraphed his accomplice, Second Judicial District Judge Benjamin Ben Steffens, have your men placed to arrest him, that meant one of the victims, and to kill all the other men, that meant the other opponents, who resist you or stand with those who do resist you. Do not hesitate at extreme measures. Your honor is at stake now, and a failure is fatal. Only 56 days after Catherine began his malicious prosecution of McSween and Tunstall, he got Tunstall murdered by Sheriff Brady and his posse, including the Jesse Evans gang. Brady, as obviously coached by Reinerson, falsely claimed that Tunstall was invading the embezzlement case's attachment by herding his, actually exempt, horses to Lincoln from his Felis River Ranch. Catron's urgency to kill resulted from the upcoming convening of the Lincoln County Grand Jury. McSween would likely be exonerated. That would free Tunstall from legal harassments using the fake partnership. 
On February 18th, 1878, Walton still herded the horses on a remote road from his Felis River Ranch toward Lincoln with his men, Brady's posse attacked. Separated from his fleeing men, Tunstall died on a lonely trail, just as had Franklin Tolby. His was an intentionally terrifying execution, with a coup de grace exploding his skull with a circumferential fracture. His face was bashed in. In perverted mockery, his hat was put on his likewise murdered horse's head. And like Tolby's corpse, Tunstall's was hidden to delay pursuit of his killers. The trauma to then 18-year-old Billy Bonney was unimaginable. Collapsed after only four and a half months was his newfound family with his marvelous father figure and a future as a rancher on the Penasco River. The next day, February 19th, Billy gave an eyewitness affidavit to Justice of the Peace, John Squire Wilson, along with Tunstall's foreman, Dick Brewer. Tunstall's coroner's jury report was done on February 19th. The named murderers were Jesse Evans and his boys, Frank Baker and Thomas Hill, Deputy George Hindman, James J. Dolan, and William Morton. To cover up the murder as self-defense, ring-eyed Fort Stanton surgeon, Dr. Daniel LaPelle, wrote a fraudulent autopsy report. He attributed Tunstall's split skull to thinning by venereal disease. He fabricated that the disease caused Tunstall's insane shooting at Posse Men. McSween countered by a legitimate autopsy by Lincoln's doctor, Taylor Ely. But Catron was poised to repeat his 1875 obstruction of arrest of Franklin Tolby's ring-eyed killers. Sheriff Brady would refuse to arrest the murderers. After they were indicted by the grand jury, District Attorney William Reinerson would refuse to write arrest warrants. There was no way that Catron could anticipate that the cataclysm he had unleashed would leave a teenager as his implacable enemy. And that teenager, Billy Bonney, whose life he had just destroyed, would transcend his own later killing by another of Catron's minions to ensure retribution in the light of his unbeatable fame. Other talks will present Lincoln County's grassroots freedom fight that caught the complacent ring by surprise as the Lincoln County War. <laughs>